You ever needed to bend some seriously thick steel? Damn! But didn't have a $30,000 press break? I've discovered a super simple technique that any small fab shop can pull off with ease. And today, I'm not just gonna show you how to bend these flanges without the fancy equipment, but I'll take you through the entire process of fulfilling a real customer order. From the initial design to the final product, let's dive in and see how it's done. It all starts with a lead. I ended up getting a message on Facebook Marketplace from a previous customer. They needed some parts cut out for a three-piece weldment. So I asked them to send some reference drawings so I could get started on the design. What was surprising to me though is that they actually sent over an image of a CAD file in a software I've never really seen before, but they told me they were using SketchUp. So if you guys have any idea about how this software is and what it's all about, let me know down in the comments. I'm really curious to see what you guys think. For every single order I get, I always redraw the parts in my own CAD software, not only for nesting purposes, but so I can also keep a running record of all the drawings I have. And this time, I had some tweaks that could definitely save the customer some time and money. So I went ahead and sent them over the fresh new design. This design included a simplification of the three-piece weldment. I turned that 90 degree flange into one bent flange. And they probably did this because they didn't have a press break and neither do I. But that's the whole reason why we came to this video, right? So more on that in a bit. The next problem, which is a super common problem in manufacturing, is that gusset location. Normally a one-off part where you just center that gusset in between the flange would be no big deal. But if you're doing 12 of these, 24, all the way up to 100, the repeatability and the time saving starts to really add up. Pro tip. Tab and slot. And yes, it's tab and slot, not slot and tab. I had a few co-workers mention about this slot and tab and I just about grabbed them by the collar. Once the drawings were approved, it was time to start cutting. And if you guys notice, I already had a bunch of parts cut out and that's because I was actually doing a live right before that here on YouTube. And I promised myself that I was gonna be trying to upload more videos and get more involved with the community here. One way I'm gonna do that is by trying to go live at least once a week, usually on Saturdays while I'm working in the shop, going through customer orders. So if that's something you guys are interested in, Make sure you stop by on Saturday, say hi, and ask me some questions. I showed you guys these parts a few times already, and if you notice the slot at the mouth of this dude who really is not impressed, that's pretty much the secret sauce on how we can end up bending these without a press break. Once all the parts were cut, it was time to deburr everything. And I'm showing you guys these clips because I wanna show you guys that even my machine has a decent amount of slag on it. I know every video, in the history of plasma cutters, anytime anybody cuts something, they're always like, oh, and look it, there's minimal slag. I can just scrape this off with my fingernail. No, every single plasma cutter I've seen has slag that needs to be removed. Doesn't matter if you're a massive manufacturer with a big old budget, you're still gonna be scraping those parts, bro. We got a slight problem, and that problem is my tab and slot locating features, my tab and my slot are not tabbing and slotting. Oh, that should be going in all the way. What happened is I did not account for the kerf angle or I didn't have my slot wide enough to account for it. And what I mean is when you're cutting them, well, that one's actually pretty good. But if you look down this line here, it's not gonna be perfectly perpendicular to the flat face. And it's probably more evident, man, where, this one's actually really good. It multiplies like tenfold inside of tight corners. What I'm going to do, instead of recutting all of these, is put them in my mill because I have a mill now. And I think it's gonna be as simple as just putting this in the vise and then just flushing up the corners, the two sides. Yeah, yeah. If only it was that simple. Because of course, this was a quarter inch slot and I only had one 3 16 end mill. And if you know anything about end mills, you know that they love to break. Oh no. 
Oh, I knew that was gonna happen. I should have slowed down. Yep, that was a carbide end mill, and that was my only 3 16 Oh, I knew that was gonna happen. I got like 10 more of these to go. So I actually got really lucky with this because way back in the day when I was a amateur woodworker, I used to do some CNC routing. And way back in the dark corner of my toolbox, I had a few of these quarter inch two flute high speed steel animals that I used to use for walnut and hardwoods. Turns out it actually cut the steel pretty nice. After that last end mill broke, I really wanted to make sure I could get this job done on time. So I stopped trying to push the feed rate super fast and just took things much slower. And it took me about two hours to complete all 24 of these. But that wasn't just milling a slot, it was also drilling a few holes. There were three mounting holes on the top that were supposed to be three A's, but because of that curve problem we were having at the beginning, I had to drill all of these out again. This wasn't the end of the world. All I did was basically use the drill bit as a reamer just to clean up the insides of the holes, but this was really hard on the drill bit because even though these were decently high quality drill bits, the inside of the holes were surface hardened by the stream of plasma and the rapid cooling of the water. So this drill bit wasn't toast, but it would definitely need a good sharpening after this job. All the holes are drilled. Now I gotta go deburr all the holes and then bend all of them. That's gonna take a while. Go do it. Since this is probably the most important part of the video, I'm gonna raw dog you guys. Very minimal editing so you can follow along. Okay, so now that it's taken care of, I'm gonna line this bend line up right on the edge of this table. I'm gonna go about two and a quarter and basically just hit each side and then clamp her down. Oh, I moved it. Great. Once we got her clamped down, I'm just gonna bend it as far as I can because this wrench will end up hitting the table before we get to 90. If you don't have a fixture table with these clamps, you could always tack it to your regular welding table as well. And then once I get close to 90 to bring it out just a little bit so I can get, the, get it the rest of the way. And then this time it doesn't matter if it's lined up since the bends are, it's gonna follow the bend that it was already in. This does take a little bit to get used to, but into my third or fourth part, I was almost one-shotting these just from muscle memory, and the angles were coming out perfect. Pretty good there, and the gusset fits pretty good. Two down, 14 more to go. There it is guys, a simple easy way to form thick sheet metal parts without the need of a brake press. Would I much rather have a brake press? Yes sir. But you don't always get what you want, so you make do with what you have. I think these parts turned out really well, and the customer was happy that I saved them a bunch of time, because that's what really matters, customer satisfaction. Go ahead and give this technique a try for yourself, and let me know down in the comments how it worked. Thanks for watching, see you next time.